From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Well, welcome to the Cube Conversation here in the Cube Studios in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, your host. Got a great conversation here with two great guests, going to explore the edge, what it means in terms of commercial, but also national security. And as the world goes digital, we're going to have that deep dive conversation around um, how it's all transforming. We got uh, Key Lee, Vice President of Booz Allen's Digital Business. Key, great to have you. Uh, John Pisano, Principal at Booz Allen's Digital Cloud Solutions. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on. Thank thanks for having us. So one of the most hottest topics, obviously, besides cloud computing having the most refactoring impact on business and um, government and public sector has been the next phase of cloud growth and cloud scale. And that's really modern applications um, and consumer. And then here uh, for national security and for governments here in the US is the military impact. And as digital transformation starts to go to the next level, you are starting to see the architectures emerge where the edge the IOT edge, the industrial IOT edge, or any kind of edge concept, 5G uh, is exploding, making that much more of a dense, more throughput for connectivity with wireless. You got Amazon with Snowball, Snowmobile, all kinds of ways to deploy technology that's IT-like and operational <laughs> technologies. It's causing quite a cloud operational opportunity and disruption. So I want to get into it. Let's, uh, Key, let's start with you. I mean, we're looking at a, an architecture that's changing both commercial and public sector with the edge. What are the key considerations that you guys see as people have to really move fast in this new architecture of digital? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And um, if I could just uh, share our observation on why we even started investing in edge. Um, you mentioned cloud. Um, but as we've reflected upon kind of the history of IT, um, you take a look from mainframes to um, desktops, to servers, to uh, uh, cloud, to mobile, and now IOT. What we observed was that um, industry investing in infrastructure led to kind of an evolution of, uh, uh, of IT, right? So as you mentioned with industry spending billions on IOT and, and edge, um, we just feel that that's going to be the next evolution. Um, if you take a look at, um, you mentioned 5G, I think 5G will be certainly um, an accelerator to edge um, because of the, the resilience, the lower latency and so forth. But um, taking a look at what's happening in space, you mentioned space earlier as well, right? Um, and uh, what uh, Starlink is doing um, by putting satellites to actually provide transport into space um, we're thinking that that actually is going to be the next ubiquitous thing. Once transport becomes ubiquitous, just like cloud um, allows storage to be ubiquitous, we think that you know the next generation internet will be space-based. Um, so when you think about it, um, connected it won't be connected servers per se; it will be connected devices. Yeah. Um, so yeah. um, that's kind of you know some of the observations and why we've been really focusing on investing in, in edge. I want to come back to that piece around uh, space and edge and, and bring it from commercial and then also tactical architecture in a minute because there's a lot to unpack there. Role of open source, modern application development, software and hardware supply chains, all are core issues that are going to emerge. But I want to get with John real quick on cloud impact because you, know, you think about 5G uh, and the future of work or future of play, you got people, right? So whether you're at a large concert like Coachella or a 49ers or a Patriots game or Redskins game, if you're in the DC area, um, you got people there, congestion. And now you got devices now serving those people and that's the, their play, people at work, whether it's a military operation, uh, you got work, play, tactical edge things. How is cloud connecting? Cause this is like the edge has never been kind of a, an IT thing. It's been more of a, you know, bandwidth or either telco or something else operationally. What's the cloud at scale, cloud operation impact? Yeah, so we, if you think about how these systems are architected and you think about those considerations that Key kind of touched on, a, a lot of what you have to think about now is what aspects of the application reside in the cloud where you're, you tend to be less constrained and then how do you architect that application to move out towards the edge, right? So how do I tier my application? Ultimately, how do I move data and applications around the ecosystem and, and how does, how how do I need to evolve where my application stages things and how that data and, and, and those apps are moved to each of those different tiers. So it, when we build a lot of applications, right, especially if they're in the cloud, they're built with some of those common considerations of elasticity, scalability, all those things. Whereas when you talk about congestion and disconnected operations, 
you lose a lot of those characteristics and you have to kind of rethink that. Key, let's get into the um, aspect you brought up, which is space. And then the, I, I was mentioning the tactical edge from a military standpoint. These are um, use cases of deployments, you know, and, and in fact, this is how people have to work now. So you got the future of work or play, uh, and now you've got this situational uh, deployments, whether it's a new tower next to a stadium. We've all been at a, at a game or somewhere, a concert where we all got five bars and no connectivity, right? So we know what that means. Right. So right. now you have you know, people con congregating in work or play, and now you have a tactical deployment. What's the key things that you're seeing that is going to help make that better? Are there any breakthroughs that you see that are, that are possible? What's, what's going on in your, in your view? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what's uh, enabling all of this, um, again, one is uh, transport, right? So whether it's 5G to increase the, the speed and decrease the latency, whether it's um, things like Starlink uh, with uh, making uh, transport and comms ubiquitous, that tied with the fact that um, chips continue to get smaller and, and faster, right? Um, and when you're thinking about tactile edge, um, those devices have limited um, uh, size, weight, power, uh, conditions and constraints. Um, and, and so the software that goes on them has to be just as lightweight. And, and that's why we've actually partnered with uh, SUSE and uh, what they've done with K3S's um, to do that, right? Um, so I think um, those, those are some of the enabling technologies um, out there uh, John, as you've kind of alluded to, there are some, there are additional challenges, right? Um, uh, uh, as we think about it, we're not, it's not a, a simple transition and modernization here, um, but um, again, we think that this will be the next major disruption. What do you guys think, uh, John, if you don't mind weighing in too on this, as, as modern application development happens, we just were covering cloud native con and KubeCon, DockerCon, containers are very popular, Kubernetes is becoming super great. As you look at the telco landscape where we're kind of converging this edge, it has to be commercially enterprise grade. It has to have that transit and transport that's intelligent um, and all these new things. So how does open source fit into all this? Because we're seeing open source becoming very reliable. More people are contributing to open source. How does that impact the edge in your opinion? So from, from my perspective, I think it's helping accelerate things that traditionally maybe may have been stuck in the traditional you know, proprietary software confines, right? Like, so within our mindset at Booz Allen, we are very focused on open architecture, open-based systems, which open source obviously is a, an aspect of that, right? So how do you create systems that can easily interface with each other to exchange data? Um, and how do you leverage tools that are available in the open source community to do that, right? So containerization, right, it is a big drive that is really going throughout the open source community. And there's just a number of other tools, whether it's tools that are used to provide basic services, like how do I move code through a pipeline all the way through, how do I do just basic hardening and security checking of my capabilities, right? Historically, those have tend to be, you know, closed source type apps, whereas today you've got a very broad community that's able to very quickly um, provide and develop capabilities and push it out to a community that then continues to adapt and, and, and add to it or grow that, that library of stuff. Yeah, and then, you know, we've got trends like Open RAN. I saw some um, ground station for AWS, You're starting to see Starlink you mentioned. You're bringing connectivity to the masses. What is that going to do for um, operators? Because remember, security is a huge issue, right? We talk about security all the time. Where mm -hmm. does that kind of come in? Because now you're, you're really OT, which has been very purpose built kind of devices in the old IOT world. As the new IOT and the edge develop, you're going to need to have intelligence. You need to be data driven. There is an open source impact key. So, you know, how, if, I'm a, if I'm a senior executive, how do I get my arms around this? I, I really need to think this through because um, the security risks yeah. alone could be more penetration areas, more surface area. Right, um, that's a great question. And, and uh, let me just address kind of the value to, um, the clients and the end users um, in, in the digital battlefield is, is our warriors, right? To increase survivability um, uh, and, and lethality. Um, you know, at the end of the day, from a mission perspective, we you know we believe that time's a weapon. So reducing reducing any latency in that kind of orient, observe, orient, decide, act, OODA loop um, is value to the warfighter. Um, in terms of your question on how, how to think about this, John, you, you're, you're, you're spot on. I mean, as I mentioned before, there are, are various different challenges. One being 
uh, the cyber aspect of it. Um, you, you know, we are absolutely going to be increasing our attack surface, right? When we think about um, putting processing on edge edge devices, um, there are other factors too, non-technical that we've been thinking about um, as as we've tried to kind of engender and kind of move to this kind of edge open ecosystem where we can kind of plug and play, reuse all kind of taking the same concepts uh, of the open source community and, and open architectures. Um, but other things that we've considered, one, um, workforce. Um, as you mentioned before, when you think about these embedded systems and so forth, you know there aren't that many embedded engineers out there, right? But there is a workforce that are digital uh, and, and software engineers that are trained. So how do we actually create an abstraction layer that we can leverage that workforce and not be limited um, by uh, some of the uh, constraints of the embedded engineers uh, out there. Um, the other thing is what we've, what we've uh, in talking with several uh, colleagues, clients, partners, what people aren't thinking about is actually when you start putting software on these edge devices in the billions, um, the total cost of ownership, right? How do you maintain an enterprise that potentially consists of billions of devices, right? So extending um, the, the the standard kind of DevSecOps that we move to automate, you know, CI, CD to a cloud, how do we move it from cloud to jet, right? That's kind of what we say, right? How do we move DevSecOps to automate secured uh, containers, right? All the way to the edge devices uh, to mitigate, um, you know, some of those total cost of ownership uh, challenges. It's interesting as you have software defined, this embedded system discussion is hugely relevant and important because when you have software defined, you got to be faster in the deployment of these devices. You need security because remember supply chain on the hardware side and software in there Absolutely. too. So if, if you're going to have a serviceability model where you have to shift left, as they say, you got to be at the point of CI CD flows. You need to be having security at the time of coding, right? So all these paradigms are new. Right, and day two operations, I call it day day zero operations because it should be never day two, yep. but you got to Absolutely. service these things. So software supply chain becomes a very interesting conversation. It's a new one that we're having on theCUBE and, and in the industry. Software supply chain is a superly uh, relevant, important topic because now you got to interface it, not just with other software, but it's hardware. Um, yeah. How do you service yeah. devices in space? You can't send a break fix person uh, in space. Maybe you will soon, but again, this brings up a whole set of issues. No, so, um, you know, I, I think, um, and it's certainly, um, uh, you know, I don't think anyone has the answers. We still don't, don't have all the answers, but um, opt we're very optimistic, right? Um, if you take a look at what's going on within the U.S. Air Force and and uh, what uh, the chief software officer, Nick Shalon, and his team, and we're, we're a supporter of this um, and a plank owner of Platform One, right? Um, you know, they were ahead of the curve in kind of uh, commoditizing uh, some of these, uh, you know, DevSecOps principles um, in partnership with the DOD CIO, right? Um, and that shift left concept, right? Um, they've got a certified and accredited um, platform uh, that provides that DevSecOps. They have an entire repository in the Iron Bank that uh, allows for hardened containers and, and reciprocity. All those things are value um, to the mission and, and around the edge because it's those are all accelerators, right? Um, I, I think there's an opportunity to, to, to leverage um, industry kind of best practices as well and patterns um, there. Um, you, you kind of touched upon this, John, but these devices honestly just become firmware, right? The software just, you know, if, if, if the devices themselves just become firmware, right? You can just put over the wire updates, right? Um, onto them, so I, I'm I'm optimistic, right? I think all the piece parts are are taking place across um, industry and in the government, um, and I think we're we're primed to uh, uh, kind of uh, move into this next evolution. Yeah, and it's also some collaboration. What I like about why I'm bringing up the open source angle, and I think this is where I think the major focus will shift to, and I want to get your reaction to it, is because open source is seeing a lot more collaboration. You mentioned some of the embedded devices. You know, some people are saying this is the weakest link in the supply chain and, and it can be shored up pretty quickly. But this other data, other collective intelligence that you can get from sharing data, for instance, which hasn't really been a best practice in the, in the cybersecurity industry. So now open source, it's all been about sharing, right? So you get the confluence of these worlds connect colliding, uh, all aspects of culture and dev and, and sec and ops and, and engineering all coming together. John, what's your yeah. reaction to that? Because this is a big topic. 
Yeah, so it, it it's providing a level of transparency that historically we've not seen, right? Like so in that community, having those pipelines, the results of what's coming out of it, it's allowing anyone in that life cycle or in that supply chain to look at it, see the state of it, and make a decision on is this if is this a risk I'm willing to take or not? Yeah. Or am I willing to invest and personally contribute back to the community to address that because it's important to me and it's likely going to be important to some of the others that are using it. So I think it's critical and it's an enable it's it's enabling that acceleration and shift that I talked about that now that everybody can see it, look inside of it, understand the state of it, contribute to it. It's allowing us to break down some of the barriers that Key talked about and 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 it it reinforces that excitement that we're seeing now. That that community is enabling us yeah to move faster and do things that maybe historically we've not been able to do. Key, I'd love to get your thoughts. You mentioned Battlefield and 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 uh, I've been covering a lot of the tactical edge on the DOD's work. You mentioned uh, the military on the on the Air Force side. Platform One, I believe, was from the Air Force um, uh, work that they've done. All cloud native kind of directions. But when you talk about a war field, you talk about connectivity, I mean, who controls the DNS in Taiwan or who controls the DNS in Korea? I mean, we have to deploy. You got to stand up infrastructure. How about agility? I mean, tactical um, command and control uh, operations, you got to, this has got to be really well done. So this is not a trivial thing. Um, how are you seeing no, this translate into the edge and innovation area? <laughs> yeah, no, it's certainly not a, a trivial thing, um, but I, I think, um, um, again, I'm encouraged by how government and, and industry are partnering up. Um, there's a vision set um, and around this uh, joint all domain command control, JASE2. Uh, and then all the services are, are are getting behind that or looking into that. And this vision of this military, uh, inter internet of military things, right? Um, and I think the key thing there, um, John, as you mentioned, is not just the connected of the sensors, which requires the, uh, the transport again, right? Um, but also they have to be interoperable, right? So you can have a bunch of sensors and platforms out there, but if they can't, they, they may be connected, but if they can't speak to one another, right? In, the, in a common language, right? That kind of defeats the purpose um, and, and the mission value, right? Of that, you know, sensor to shooter kind of paradigm that we've been striving for, for, for ages, right? Um, so you, you're, you're right on. I mean, this is not a trivial thing, but I think over history, we've learned quite a bit. Um, technology and innovation is happening at, at just an amazing rate, right? Um, where things are coming out in, in you know, months as opposed to decades uh, as you know, before, right? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I agree, not, not trivial, but again, I think there are all the piece parts in place um, and being put into place. I think you mentioned earlier that the personnel, the people, engineers out there, not enough more of them coming in. I think now the uh, the appetite and the, the provocative nature of this shift in tech is going to attract a lot of people because you know the old adage is these are hard problems, attracts great people. You got a new engineering SRE like scale engineering. Yeah. Um, you have software development that's changing, becoming much more robust and, and more science driven. You don't have to be just a coder as a software engineer. You could you come at it from any angle. So there's a lot more opportunities from a personnel standpoint now to attract great people. And there's real hard problems to solve. Um, not Absolutely. Security. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that hundred um, percent. I would also contest that um, it's an opportunity for uh, innovators, right? Uh, you know, we've been thinking about this for some time and um, you know, we think there's absolute value from various different use cases that we've identified, digital battlefield, force protection, um, uh, 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 disaster recovery and so forth. But, you know, there, there are use cases that we probably haven't even thought about even from a commercial perspective, right? So I think there's going to be an opportunity just like the internet back in the early, you know, mid you know, nineties, right? For us to kind of innovate based on this new kind of um, edge uh, environment. It's a revolution, new leadership, new brands are going to emerge, new paradigms, new, new workflows, new operations, clearly great stuff. I want to thank you guys for coming on. I also want to thank Rancher Labs for sponsoring this conversation. Uh, without their support, we wouldn't be here. Uh, now they were acquired by SUSE. Uh, we've covered their event with the Cube uh, virtual last year. Um, what's, the, what's the connection with uh, those guys? Can you guys take a minute to, to explain the relationship with SUSE and Rancher? Yeah, um, so um, it's actually, uh, it's fortuitous. Um, and I think we just got, we got lucky. Um, 
there's two uh, aspects of it. First of all, um, we are both, um, we partner um, in, in our, uh, on the platform one uh, basic ordering agreement. So uh, just there, you know, we had a common mentality, right, of DevSecOps. And, and so there was a good partnership there. But then when we thought about, we're engaging from an edge perspective, um, you know, they're K3Ss, right? I mean, they're a leader from a container perspective, obviously, but uh, the fact that they are innovators in around K3Ss, right, to reduce that software footprint, which is required on these edge uh, devices, um, you know, we, we kind of got a twofer there in, in that partnership. Awesome, John, any comment on your end? Yeah, I would just amplify the, you know, the, 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 the K3S aspects and leveraging the containers. A lot of what we've seen success in when you look at what's going on, especially on that tactical edge around enabling capabilities, containers and the portability it provides makes it very easy for us to interface and integrate a lot of different sensors to close the OODA loop to whoever's wearing or operating that piece of equipment that the software is running on. Awesome, I'd love to, to uh, continue the conversation on space and the edge um, and super great conversation to have you guys on, really appreciate it. I do want to ask you guys about the in innovation and the opportunities uh, of this new shift that's happening. There's an, the next big thing is coming quickly and it's here on us and that's cloud, I call it cloud 2.0, the cloud scale, modern software development environment, uh, edge with 5G, changing the game. I, Key, I completely agree with you and I think this is where people are focusing their attention from startups to um, companies that are transforming and repivoting or refactoring their, their uh, existing uh, assets to be positioned. And you're starting to see clear winners and losers as a pattern emerging, right? You got to be in the cloud, you got to be leveraging data, you got to be uh, horizontally scalable, but you got to have AI machine learning in there with modern software practices that are secure. That's the playbook. Some people are making right. it, some people are not getting there. So I got to ask you guys, you know, as uh, telcos become super uh, important and the ability to be a telco now, and we just mentioned standing up uh, a tactical edge, for instance, uh, launching a satellite, a couple hundred K, you can launch a, a CubeSat. Um, that could be good and bad, right? So, so, you know, the telco business is changing radically. Cloud, telco cloud is emerging as an edge phenomenon with 5G. Certainly business commercial benefits, more than consumer. How do you guys see the innovation and disruption happening with telco? Um, you know, as we think through um, cloud to edge, um, one thing that we realized, because our definition of edge, John, was actually at the point of data collection, right? On the sensor themselves. O others definition of edges were a little bit further back, what we call the edge of the IT enterprise. Um, but you know, as we look at this, we realize that you need you needed this kind of multi echelon environment, right? From your your cloud to your tactical clouds, right? Where you can do some processing, and then at the edge themselves. Really, at the end of the day, it's all about I think data, right? I mean, everything we're talking about is still all about the data, right? The AI needs the data. The telco is transporting the data, right? And so um, I think if you think about it from a data perspective in relation to the telcos, right? One, edge will actually enable a very different paradigm and a, a distributed paradigm for data processing, right? So, hey, instead of bringing the data to some central cloud, right? Uh, which takes bandwidth off your telcos, push the process to the data, right? So mitigate what's actually being sent over those telco lines to increase the efficiencies of them. Right, um, so I, I think you know at, at the end of the day, uh, the telcos are going to have a, a, a pretty big uh, component to this, um, even from space down to ground station. Right, how how that works. Um, so um, the the network of these telcos, I think, are just going to expand. John, your, what's your perspective? I mean, startups are coming out, the scalability speed of innovation is a big factor. The old telco days are like, I mean, you know, months and years, new towers go up and now you got backbone, you got, you know, it's kind of a slow glacier pace. Now it's under siege with rapid innovation. Yeah, so um, I definitely echo the sentiments that Key would have, but I would also, if we go back and think about the digital battle space and what we've talked about, um, Faster speeds being available, you know, in places it's not been before is great. However, when you think about facing an adversary that's a near peer threat, the first thing they're going to do is make it contested, congested, and you have to be able to survive. I, I, 
while yes, the, the pace of innovation is absolutely pushing comms to places we've not had it before, um, we have to be mindful to not get complacent and over rely on it, assuming it'll always be there. Because I know in my experience wearing the uniform, and even if I'm up against an adversary, that's the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do whatever I can to disrupt your ability to communicate. So how do you take it down to that lowest level and still make that squad, the platoon, whatever that structure is, you know, continue to survivable and lethal. So that's something I think as we look at the innovations, we need to be mindful of that. So when I talk about how do you architect it? What services do you use? Those are all those things that you have to think about. What if I lose it at this echelon? How, could, how do I continue the mission? Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at how companies have been procuring and consuming technology key, it's been like siloed. Okay, we got a workplace, workforce project, uh, and we have the tactical edge, and we have the you know siloed IT solution, when really work and play, whether it's work here and, and John's example, is the warfighter. And so his concern is safety, is, is life, right? And, and protection. Sure. Uh, yeah, the other uh -huh. department has to manage the comms. <laughs> and so yeah. they have to have countermeasures and contingencies ready to go, right? So all this is, yeah. they're all integrated now. It's not like one department. It's like, it's uh -huh. it's together. Yeah, John, I, mean, you, you, uh, I love what you just said. I mean, we have to get away from this silo of thinking, um, not only within a singular organization, uh, but across the enterprise, right? Um, you know, from a digital battlefield perspective, you know, I, I, I you know, it's a joint, fight, right? So even across these enterprise of enterprises, right? So I think you're spot on. We have to look horizontally. Uh, we have to integrate, we have to interoperate. Um, and, and by doing that, that's where the innovation is also going to be accelerated too, right? Yeah. Not reinventing the wheel. Yeah, yes. uh, you know, I think the infrastructure edge is so key. It's going to be very interesting to see how the existing incumbents can handle uh, themselves. Obviously, the the towers are important. 5G obviously is much more more deployments, not as centralized in terms of the of the spectrum. Uh, it's more dense. It's going to create more connectivity options. Um, how do you guys see that impacting? Because certainly more gear, like obviously not not the centralized tower from a backhaul standpoint, but now the the edge, the radios themselves, the wireless uh, 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 transit is key. Um, that's the real edge here. How does how do you guys see that evolving? So, um, you know, we're seeing a, we're seeing a lot of um, innovations actually through small companies who are really focused on very specific uh, niche problems. And I think it's a great starting point um, because what they're doing is showing the art of the possible, right? Um, because again, we're in a different environment now. There's different rules, there's different capabilities. Uh, but then we're also seeing, um, you mentioned earlier on, um, uh, some of the larger companies, Amazon, and Microsoft, also investing um, as well, right? So um, I, I think the merge of the you know are the unconstrained are the possible, yeah. right? By these small companies that are you know just kind of driving you know uh, innovations, um, supported by the 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 maturity and the, the 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 heft of these large companies who are building out kind of these um, hardened kind of uh, capabilities. Um, they're going to converge at some point, right? Um, and, and that's where I think we're going to get further innovation. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Final question for you guys, as people are watching this, a lot of smart executives and teams are coming together to kind of put the battle plans together for their companies as they transition from old to this new way, which is clearly cloud scaled, roll of data. We kind of, we, we hit up all the key points I think here. As they start to think about architecture and how they deploy their resources, this becomes now the new boardroom conversation that trickles down and includes everyone, including the developers. You know, the developers are now going to be on the front lines. Um, Mid-level managers are going to be integrated in as well. It's a group conversation. What are some of the mm -hmm. advice that you would give to folks who are in this mode of planning, architecture, trying to be positioned to come out of this pandemic with a massive growth opportunity and, and to be on the right side of history? What's your advice? Um, this is a great question. Um, so I, I think um, you, you touched upon it. Um, one is take the holistic approach. Uh, you mentioned architecture a couple of times and I think that's, that's critical. Understanding um, how your edge architectures will actually connect with your cloud architectures so that they're, they're not disjointed, right? They're not siloed, right? They're interoperable, they integrate. So you're taking that enterprise approach. Um, I think the second thing is be patient. Uh, it took us some time to really kind of, and we've been looking at this for uh, about three years now. Um, and we were, you know, very intentional 
in assessing the landscape, how people were, you know, um, discussing around edge um, and kind of pulling that all together. But it took us some time to even figure out kind of, hey, what are the use cases? How can we actually apply this and get some ROI and value um, out for our clients, right? So being a little bit patient um, in thinking through kind of how you can leverage this and potentially be a disruptor. John, your thoughts on advice to people watching as they try to put the right plans together to be positioned and not foreclose any future value. Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to the points that Key raised, I, I would number one, amplify the fact of recognize that you're going to have a hybrid environment of legacy and modern capabilities. And in addition to thinking, you know, open architectures and whatnot, think about your culture, the people, your processes, your, your techniques and whatnot, and your governance. How do you make decisions when it needs to be closed versus open? Where do you invest in the workforce? What decisions are you going to make in your architecture that drive that, that hybrid world that you're going to live in? All those recipes, you know, patience, open, all that. that it, I think we often overlook the cultural people aspect of, you know, upskilling. This is a very different way of thinking on modern software de delivery. Like how do you go through this life cycle? How is security embedded? So making sure that's part of that boardroom conversation, I think is key. John Pisano, Principal of Booz Allen Digital Cloud Solutions. Thanks for, for sharing that great insight. Key Lee, Vice President at Booz Allen Digital Business. Gentlemen, great conversation. Thanks for that insight. And I think people watching are going to probably learn a lot on how to evaluate startups to how they put their architecture together. So I really appreciate the, uh, the insight and commentary. Thank you. Okay, I'm John Furrier. This is a CUBE Conversation. Uh, thanks for watching.